So this question is called Marchant. It's a consolidated statement of profit or loss. Uh, it features one of the favourite topics for a consolidated statement of profit and loss at P2, which is the disposal of a subsidiary. And here we've got two subsidiaries, we've made two disposals, just to add to the excitement of the question. The first thing that we need to do is to establish our group structure. So we have a parent company, and our parent company is Marchant. And it says that Marchant had an investment in a company called Nathan. And it started off, uh, it says in note one, we bought 60%. And then we sold 8%. And notice the date of sale. The date of sale was the 30th of April, X4, end of the year. So therefore, when it comes to allocating profits to the NCI, the NCI are always going to take 40% of Nathan. Our other investment was a company called Option. Again, we started off with 60%, but it, it says in note 3, on the 1st of November X3, what do we do in the exam? We get these out, we get out your fingers, and you go. When was our year end? April, so therefore it's May, June, July, August, September, October, through to the 1st of November. So we had 60% of option for six months of the year. We sold 40%. So therefore we're going to 20% for six months of the year. So therefore option is an associate. Because it says, after the disposal, Marchant exerts significant influence. So that's ticking a box, isn't it? You've covered associates at F7. Therefore, when I consolidate, I'm going to consolidate Nathan for 12 months. an option for six months. And I think it's really important to get that right because there are quite a few marks given in the exam for just getting those broad principles correct. Let us now deal with our key numbers. Revenue, parent, 100%. Subsidiary, 100%. And there are still people sitting P2 exams who will just take 60% of income, 60% of revenue. So there's still people who are making fundamental errors. And when it comes to option, I've got a figure of 70, but I'm going to multiply that by 6 twelfths to give me 35. And now I'm going to go through all of my expenses and do exactly the same. Parent plus subsidiary plus option for six months. And again, get into that habit of leaving space between items. Other income, 21, 7, 6 twelfths is 1. Admin expenses, my admin expenses, 15, 9, 6 twelfths of option. Other expenses, 35, 19, and 4. I don't put in operating profit or gross profit or profit before tax. I only put in the expenses and the income, the subheadings I don't bother with.
there's no marks for operating profit. There's no marks for profit before tax. There's no marks for gross profit in the exam. We're not preparing a set of accounts. We're sitting in exams. So therefore, we do what is necessary to maximise our marks. Finance costs. Five, six. Option times two twelfths is two. Finance income. Six, five. Option times six twelfths. And then income tax. Income tax is a bit annoying. Nineteen, nine. And then I have to put in a figure of 2.5. So that is dealing with that first piece of information. And it, it then says, other comprehensive for the year net of tax, items that will not be classified to profit or loss, revaluation surplus, So I've got this figure here of 10. And when it comes to other, co other comprehensive income, strictly, and I wouldn't get too hung up about this, strictly we should split it between items which can be reclassified to profit on loss, normally on the disposal of an asset, and assets and items which cannot. So that gives us our total comprehensive income and expense, so therefore we've dealt with that first part of the question. On the 1st of May X2, so I've got note number 1, Marchant acquired 60% of Nathan. The purchase consideration was cash of 80 million. So I need a goodwill calculation. Cost. of investment 80. Although this is a statement of profit or loss question, we still need to know how to deal with goodwill. The fair value of the net assets acquired was 110. So if I go to net assets for Nason, I'm going to have uh, at the SFP date and the acquisition date, I'm just going to put in here fair value 110. The fair value of the NCI at acquisition was 45 million. So into our goodwill calculation, I'm going to say NCI at acquisition 45 million. It also says the share capital, so we go to Nathan, share capital 25, retained earnings are 65, we've then told the OCE is 6. The excess of the fair value is due to non-depreciable land. So we've got a fair value adjustment. If I add these up, 25 plus 65 gives me 90, plus 6 gives me a figure of 96. So I've got a fair value adjustment of 14. And that fair value adjustment will still exist at the SFP date. Remember the SFP date is also the same as the disposal date. It says goodwill has been annually tested for goodwill. 
and at the start of the year had been reduced in value by 20%. Now, normally I would say don't calculate goodwill, but here they're giving us, the examiner is giving us all of the information in relation to goodwill. So what I can do is I can calculate goodwill at this point and go less net assets. at acquisition. We've been given that total in working number two. So that figure is 110. Which gives me a goodwill figure of 15. At the start of the year, it had been reduced in value, it had been impaired by 20%. 20% of 15 is 3. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, why is he doing all of this? Because goodwill's an item that appears in the statement of financial position. So why is he getting excited? The reason why I'm getting excited about it, well, it's P2. I always get excited about P2, as you know. And the reason why I'm getting excited about it, it says, at the 30th of April X4, the impairment of goodwill had reversed and goodwill was now valued at 2 million above its original value. The upward change in value has been included in the above draft financial statements. We can't do that. Goodwill impairments cannot be reversed per IFRS. Not only have they reversed it, but they've also added on another 2 million for goodwill. The $2 million increase. cannot appear either. Now it says in the question the upward change in value has been included in the above draft financial statements. We must therefore reverse the full five million dollar gain. Now I don't know where it's appeared, I'm going to assume that it is included in other income. Now you might have said that you think you thought it was netted off against expenses. Because the examiner has not given full details, how you treat it is down to you. But what I'm going to do goodwill adjustment from working number three. I'm going to take five million and deduct that from my other income. Now what you could do is you could add five million to your costs if you think it's been netted off against admin expenses. Doesn't matter. So long as it appears somewhere in your statement of profit or loss, you would have always picked up the maximum marks. March and accounts for investments in subsidiaries using IFRS financial instruments and has made an election to show gains and losses in other comprehensive income. The carrying amount of the investment in Nathan was 90 million at the 30th of April X3 and 95 million 
at the 30th of April X4 before the disposal of the shares. So what they have done here is that in the books of the parent company, he's credited £5 million to other comprehensive income. And that is acceptable in the books of the parent. But what we have to do, and this is a bit of a nerd point, is that we've got a total revaluation surplus of 10, of which 5 relates to Nathan. So I'm going to reduce my revaluation surplus in respect of the subsidiary because we're consolidating. And therefore, if we're consolidating, we cannot show a gain by revaluing the, our shares in ourself. And that's, that's a really nasty point. I'd expect very few people to pick up on that. So that deals with note two. We've only got seven more left. Note three. Merchant acquired 60% of option on the 30th of April X2. The consideration was cash of 70 million. Now there's lots of marks in the exam for being able to deal with your basics. So our cash consideration was 70, so I'm sticking to my basics. Go to the goodwill calculation, cost of investment, 70. The net assets were fair valued at 86. So option at acquisition, fair value. 86 and I'm not given a breakdown so that that's fine you know sometimes I'll set up a working you don't particularly use it the MCI had a fair value of 28 million at that date so I'm going to put my MCI at acquisition in at 28 and my net assets at acquisition we've just established have a fair value of 86 That means that goodwill has a fair value of 12. On the 1st of November X3, Marchant disposed of 40% of option. Uh, have I missed off? Oh, right, so I've missed off note two. I've missed off a bit of notes too, haven't I? Um, just going back to note two. Sorry, I'm sorry I missed that. Marchant disposed of 8% of Nathan on the 30th of April X4 for a cash consideration and it accounted for the gain or loss in other income. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to set up a working on the Nathan disposal. And it accounted for the gain or loss in other income. So our gain to the parent is going to be the sale proceeds. Well, how much did we sell the shares for? We've sold the shares for 18 million. What was the cost of those shares? We originally bought 60% of the shares and the original cost was 95 why did I say it oh yeah cost stroke value the value in the accounts is 95 what have we sold? We have sold 8% of our 60% investment. So 95 times 8 divided by 60, 
the gain to the parent is 5.3. Now, the parent has credited that figure of 5.3 to its income statement, and that's acceptable in the books of the parent, but we're preparing the consolidated accounts. So that's being credited to other income. But I'm now going to reverse that Nathan gain of 5.3, and that comes from working number 6. Because as far as the group is concerned, we're going to calculate a different figure. carrying value of Nathan at the 30th of April X4 was 120 million. So if I now go to here, the carrying value was 120 million before any adjustments on consolidation. But remember, on consolidation, we put through a fair value adjustment of 14. So therefore, the fair value of Nathan at the disposal date was 134. Now, that again is a horrible adjustment. And less than 0% of students would probably get that correct in the exam. But what we need to do is to be able to understand the principles. As far as we are concerned, when we work out the gain to the group, what have we done? We have sold shares. So we've debited cash with the sale proceeds of 18. If we've sold shares, our investment has gone from 60 to 52%. So the NCI's investment has increased. How much has the NCI's investment increased? The NCI now has a further 8% of Nathan. At the disposal date, how much was Nathan worth? If we go back, absolutely, go back to working number two, Nathan is worth 134, but I've not finished yet. Which method are we using? We are using the fair value method. If you're using the fair value method, the NCI's investment includes their share of goodwill. Therefore, I have to add on the figure for goodwill at the date of disposal, and the figure for goodwill at the disposal date was 12 million. Horrible. In the exam, I would imagine that if there was two marks for this, provided you did debit, cash, credit, NCI, you would have picked up at least one mark. So don't expect to get it all right. Oh, right, yes, yes. Yeah, I keep keep pressing stop and start, and sometimes I get it wrong. So let's now take a look at the gain on the sale of options. And because we are losing control, it is sale proceeds plus the NCI At disposal plus the 
plus the value of the remaining investment less the net assets at disposal less the goodwill at disposal. And again, let's think smart. We know the sale proceeds are 18. And this is a, a very good formula, which to re I think it's a really important formula to remember. We've worked out goodwill. So goodwill is 12. We are told in the question, options identifiable net assets were 90 million at disposal. So the examiner is giving us all the information and the value of the NCI was 34. So I can put that in. The remaining investment was 40 million. So can you see that the examiner has given us all of the information that we require? Sale proceeds should be 50. I've picked up the sale proceeds from the other company. And that gives me an overall gain on disposal of 22. Now, I could either put that into my workings here, or I think what I've done, I actually inserted an additional line. because it's an exceptional item, it's a non-recurring item. So I've got gain on disposal of subsidiary is 22, and that came from working number seven. After disposal, we exert significant influence. Therefore, what do we have? We have an associate. So I'm going to set up a working for the associate. Associate income. We use, and this is just to remind yourselves, we use the equity method. Think of the equity method as single line consolidation. What are we going to do? Well, here we're dealing with option. Option made a profit of 15 million for the year, but it was only an associate for six months of the year. And during that period, we had originally owned 60%. We sold 40%. So during the period, it was an associate we owned 20% of the company. Therefore, our associate income is 1.5 million. And there would be a mark or two marks available for that. And you should be able to deal with associates. This exam is all about showing the examiner and the marking team what you can do and not worrying about what you can't do. There's so many nasty pieces in a question but there's still things which are core. So that's note three dealt with. Marchant sold inventory to Nathan. Well, Marchant is the parent. Nathan is the subsidiary for the whole year. So what am I going to do here is I'm going to reduce revenue by 12 and cost of sales by 12. Marchant made a loss on the transaction of 2 million, but Nathan still holds 8 million in inventories at the year end. 
So what we have to do here is we've got our intragroup sales. We reduce both revenue and cost of sales by the intragroup transaction, which we've done. Group inventories should be measured at the lower of cost and net realizable value. Well, when we sold the goods, we made a loss. So therefore, it is already at the lower of cost and net realizable value because there's no profit. You only adjust for unrealized profits on inventories. So as Nathan made a loss, no further adjustment. is necessary. Now we've got some information in respect of pensions. So I've set up a new working. And we've got our opening balances for the assets And the liability, that we normally call it the obligation, at the start of the year, the assets were worth 48 and the liability 50. So at the start of the year, we had a net pension liability of two. We have our service cost. And the service cost increases the liability. Our discount rate at the start of the year is 10%. So you work out your interest figure. Ten percent of 48 you add to assets and 10 percent of 50 you add to liabilities. We have a remeasurement loss. You do your remeasurement loss at the bottom. Where do you take remeasurement losses to? Absolutely. And the remeasurement losses are not reclassified to statement of profit and loss. So pension remeasurement to our revaluation surplus was five. That was a gain, wasn't it? Where did that pension remeasurement come from? We go back to here. Um, that's working number nine. And then we have a, a past service cost of three million. 
Now the path service cost, I don't know why these figures have shifted, let me just move them back. Path service cost, we always add to liabilities. If you have a past service cost, notice the date we recognize the past service cost at the start of the year. So we charge interest on the past service cost too. So that's going to be at 10%. So that's 0.3. The figure that we take to the income statement is the service cost of 4, the interest cost of 5, the past service cost of 3, the interest on the past service cost of 0.3, less the interest on the asset of 4.8, which means we've got an expense of 7.5. Now you can add that to either admin costs or other expenses. I don't care. The examiner doesn't care. As long as it's somewhere in your income statement, so I've got other expenses. So I'm going to say here, pension. 7.5 and that's come from working number 9. Um, Note 6, on the 1st of May X2, Marchant purchased an item of PPE for 12 million, and this is being depreciated over straight line basis, that's fine. It was then revalued, and then we've got a fall in value, and we're using the revaluation model. So what I'm going to do here, and, and this, is, this is nothing to do with P2, this is... PPE is, is stuff we've all dealt with before, but let's deal with it item by item, date by date, bit by bit. So we've got the cost on the 1st of May X2, and that cost is 12 million. We revalued it a year later. So I'm going to charge depreciation to the 30th of April X3. The asset's got a 10-year life, so that's going to be 12. I'm going to depreciate it for one year. So at the revaluation date on the 30th of April X3, it's valued at 10.8. We have a new value of 13. So therefore, there is a revaluation surplus at the 30th of April X3 of 2.2 million. Um, we then have to charge depreciation to the 30th of April X4. How much is that going to be? 
where we've got a new value is 13 million. We now have nine years of life remaining. So this gives me a figure of 1.4. The value at the 30th of April X4 is 11.6. We then have another revaluation and we now revalue it down to 7 million. So our decrease in value is 4.6. When you have a decrease in value, the first thing that you do is, yeah, I'm going to take the revaluation down initially against my revaluation surplus, and then the excess of 2.4 goes to the statement of profit or loss. Now that is something which in theory you've covered at F7. No, Martin's got it. It was one of the nastier things in F7 as well. So here I go up to OCI Revaluation reversal. It's 2.2 .2 million. And I'm going to put through I'm going to put this through my other expenses. Um, revaluation two point four million. And that's come from working number 10. Item 7, share options. Remember when I taught you share options and pensions, I said about all of these things, they can come up in Section A or Section B. It's entirely at the examiner's discretion. There's an awful lot taking place in this question. At the 1st of May X2, we've got an award of 8,000 options to each of seven directors. They must remain employed for three years. The fair value at the grant date was $100. And the fair value of the option at X4 was 110 Now, it is always the fair value at the grant date that we take into consideration. So... The value of the 30th of April X3, what's it going to be? It's 8,000 options. Those options have a fair value of $100 at the grant date. We are one year into a three-year scheme. And at the 30th of April X3, we thought that three directors would leave. We've got seven directors. So we thought that four directors would be in the scheme. So that works out as 1.1 million. At the 30th of April X4, it's still 8,000 options. Just because the fair value has changed, we ignore that. It's always, these are equity settled options. It is always the fair value at the grant date. We are now 
two years into a three-year scheme and six people are staying in the scheme. So that's 3.2. So our movement, our expense to the statement of profit and loss is 2.1 million and I'm going to add that to expenses. So I'll go up here to, let's say, to other expenses, options, working 11, 2.1. What do we now do? If you've got time, you do the maths. So for revenue, and, th and this is the least important part of the question. For revenue, I've got 538. For cost of sales, I've got 383. For other income, I've put through a large number of adjustments, and you might have put through some of these adjustments elsewhere. I've ended up with a figure of 18.7. For admin, 30. For other expenses, and you might put the, the pension through as an admin expense. I don't care, neither does the examiner. What the, what the examiner and the marketing team would be looking for is, is it in the income statement somewhere? Add those all together, and that adds up to 70. Yeah. But yes, fair comment. Yep. For some reason, I've missed off note eight. I got so excited at note seven that I forgot note eight. So let's just go back to note eight. Uh, a loss on the cash flow hedge of three million has been included in the subsidiary's finance cost. If you've got a cash flow hedge, gains and losses are taken to OCI. So what I'm going to do here is say cash flow hedge. We've got a loss of three. So I'm going to add that loss back. And I'm going to take it to OCI. It can be recycled into profit or loss. Cash flow hedge. Sorry about that. Let's just check uh, the other notes to this question. So having put through all of these adjustments, I've ended up, and you need to work out your profit after tax, your net profit for your subsidiaries. For Nathan, Nathan ends up with a profit after tax of 22 million, an option 7.5 million. I can now work out the NCI. For Nathan, 40% times 22 is 8.8. .8. And if I take a look at option, it's also 40%. 40% times 7.5 gives me a figure of 3. Add those two together. And the NCI have 11.8. And you can then try to tidy up the question and transfer these figures to the face of the answer. That's the least important thing. If you've calculated all the individual figures, you're going to be fairly close to the 30, 35 marks that we're looking for here. Okay, so I'm not going to do that. It's just going to take up time.